Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Isaac Christopher Lugogo. Listen, today we're going to talk about something very interesting that is extremely important for undergraduates, postgraduates, people who are doing masters, even PhD. Issues that have to do with how to conduct a successful research in terms of getting an A. Now, let's see. Selecting the right topic of your research is extremely important. Now, a well-chosen topic will not only engage your interest, but also contribute to your academic and even professional goal ultimately. So I'm going to provide some steps on how you can select the right research topic. Number one is what we call self-reflection. So before you start your research, start by reflecting on your interest in terms of your passion, in terms of your area of curiosity, and think about perhaps what excites you and what you'd like to learn more in terms of that perspective. It's extremely important because that will give you the impetus and the momentum. Number two, it's important to set academic and career goals. It's important to know, for example, how your topic is going to align with your academic or your career goal in terms of your contribution to your field of study or profession. So, in other words, does it address the problem? That is extremely important in terms of, you know, beginning your journey. Number three is what they call research feasibility. Now, under research feasibility, you must understand how to assess the feasibility of your research topic. Do you have the access, for example, for the necessary resources, data, or even equipment in terms of your topic? Can you realistically complete your research within the given time frame? Those are questions you need to ask yourself. And then another important aspect is aspect has to do with what they call the review of the literature. Now, that is a bit important in the sense that conducting literature review would need you to explore existing research topics that will help you to identify the gaps in terms of the literature and in terms of the potential research questions. Another important thing is to narrow down or even broaden your scope. How do you do that? Depending on the scope of your research, you may need to narrow or broaden your, you know, your topic. Consider a depth in terms of your breadth of your research question whether it is manageable within the constraints of your project. Another important aspect is to discuss with your advisors or your peers, for example. It's important. Why? Because this will help you to seek what they call input from academic advisors, perhaps professors, or even your peers. They can provide valuable guidance and help to refine your research question. Another important aspect is what they call originality and significance. Yeah? Why does that become a question? Of importance because it helps you to consider, uh, you know, how your research is going to contribute in terms of answering a novel question. Okay, so it will help make your research meaningful in terms of contribution to a particular field. Those are some things that you need to think about. And then there are what they call ethical considerations. It's important, my friends, to be mindful of what they call ethical considerations relating to your research topic. Ensure that your research adheres to ethical guidelines and respect the right and privacy of participants if possible okay another important aspect that you need to comprehend is what they call research methodology now it's important in a sense that you need to think about the research methods and the techniques that you're going to use to investigate your topic okay so are you comfortable with these methods or are you willing to learn how they perform or how they should actually help in terms of your overall research Another aspect which is extremely important, this has driven people off, is passion and motivation. So ultimately, your passion and motivation for your topic is extremely crucial. A topic that genuinely interests and motivates you will make the research process more enjoyable and even more rewarding. Sometimes we choose topics and then we, you know, we run dry and sometimes we, we are forced to do topics because our supervisors and then you don't have the momentum and the impetus to continue. So that's extremely important. Another aspect is what they call pilot research. So if you are unsure, for example, about a topic, consider considering, uh, you know, conducting what they call small scale pilot study or a primary investigation to gauge your interest and the feasibility of your research. Yeah? Another important aspect is what they call feasibility. Yeah? You will have to be open to adjusting your research topic as you learn more. It's common for research questions, for example, to evolve as you develop, you know, deeper into the literature and the data. So be mindful and be open in terms of that. And then another important aspect you need to understand is avoid overly, you know, broad or overly narrow topics. Yeah, because this will help you to strike a balance 
strive to strike a balance. An overly broad topic may actually be unmanageable, while an overly narrow one may actually limit your potential in terms of meaningful findings. Yeah, So that is important even as you engage in your research for your undergraduate or for your master's or for your PhD. Also test your research question. You know, you need to formulate research questions that, for example, escalate you know, around your topic. So a well-defined question should actually be concise, it should be specific, and should also be focused. So remember, my friends, that right research topics will evolve with your interest and expertise. It should be flexible enough to accommodate changes, but structured enough to provide what they call a clear research direction. So ultimately, choosing a research topic is a personal and often you know, interactive process. So take your time and be thoughtful in terms of your selection. It's extremely, extremely, extremely important. And I think that's what we miss up in many of our universities today. Sometimes we are forced to do research. Sometimes they select certain areas for us. Let, let it come out of you so that you can be able to enjoy it, yeah? Now, a thesis, in terms of proposal, a thesis proposal basically becomes, especially for law, in the field of law, typically consists of several components, yeah? These components provide a structured framework for your proposed research helping you, you know, to convey your research in terms of a good, planned, and effective way. I'm going to give you some components of what would be required in terms of a thesis proposal. Number one is what they call a title page. Yeah. Now, the title page should obviously be concise, but also be descriptive of your research topic. In others, it should include your name, your institution, your department, and, and precisely the date. That's as simple as that. Yeah. Now, sometimes you can engage in what they call an abstract. Now, usually an abstract is a brief of the proposal, typically around, say, 150 to about 250 words. And should, it should actually provide an overview of the research problem in terms of objectives, in terms of the methodology, and sometimes what they call expected outcomes. That is just for, for, for you know, as we begin to engage in serious research. Then introduction. Introduction basically will engage in terms of introducing what they call the research problem or even the question. Now, it should actually provide the context by discussing the significance of the issue within the field of law. Yeah, I'm talking about law for, for purposes of those who are doing law and research. State the purpose of the study and your specific research objectives. Mention an existing legal, even academic debate related to this topic. It will help you in terms of the comprehension. Don't worry, we're going to go into uh, the nitty gritties as well. Yeah. Now, there's also what they call literature review. Uh, under literature review, you will be required to summarize uh, relevant literature and research. In, in terms of identifying the key components or the concepts, for example, the theories and the debates relating to your research area. Yeah. So you'll be required to explain how your research fits into this existing body of knowledge. So you're supposed to highlight any gaps in the literature that your research aims to address. Yeah. That is extremely important. Yes. Another important aspect is what they call the research questions or hypothesis. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably make a distinction in terms of that at a later stage. Now, clearly state the research questions or the hypothesis that your thesis will actually address. Ensure that they are specific and they are focused and they directly related to the research problem. Yes, that is extremely important. And then also think about what they call the methodology. Yeah, under methodology, describe the research methods that you plan to use. Explain how you will collect, for example, and even analyze the data. For example, in terms of legal analysis, in terms of case studies, in terms of surveys, in terms of interviews, discuss the rationale for choosing these methods. Address any ethical considerations such as any informed consent or even confidentiality if applicable. Listen, also talk about what they call data collection and analysis plan. Provide a detailed plan for collecting and analyzing data. Specify data sources and even data collection instruments if relevant. And also it's important for you to explain the data analysis techniques that you'll employ, including any software or tools to that effect. Yeah. And then also sometimes we have, may have to discuss what they call the expected outcomes. It's important, by the way, to outline, for example, the potential results or even findings of your research. Yeah. So you, so you will be required at a certain time to discuss how these outcomes will actually contribute to the field of law, for example, or even to address the research problem in terms of identifying the implications of your research. Yeah. That is also important in terms of your proposal. And then the time frame, uh, in terms of timeline, create a schedule that, you know, that outlines the different phases of your research, from literature review to data analysis and to the writing. You're supposed to indicate you know, milestones and deadlines to help you manage your research in an effective way. Yeah? 
Another important aspect is that you need to be conversant with uh, what you call the references. And the references you will require to have what they call provide a comprehensive list of all the sources in terms of the books, in terms of the articles, in terms of legal documents that you have referenced in your proposal. It should be, you know, ensure that you follow, by the way, a consistent citation, you know, style. For example, you could use what they call Blue Book, or you could use what they call APA, or you could use what they call Harvard, or you can use Oscola, depending on whatever you prefer, or whatever your institution has directed you to use, yeah? And then appendices, if necessary, include any supplementary materials such as informed consent forms, for example, or even questionnaires, or even legal documents that are relevant for your research, yeah? And then bibliography. Bibliography, if, for example, if it is separate from the references section, it, it basically would engage you to have a list of additional resources that you have actually consulted during your research but have not directly cited in your proposal. Yeah? So remember, my friends, that the specific requirements for a thesis proposal in law may actually vary depending on your institution and program. Yeah? So it is important, my friends, to check with your academic advisors or program guidelines to ensure that you're meeting all the necessary requirements for your thesis proposal. That becomes extremely, extremely important. If you engage this, I know some universities have, are teaching it, some don't, some look at it as what? As, as others compulsory, others is not compulsory. But how we should, and other high institutions becomes compulsory because it, it's an element of, of encouraging students to, to be able to, to do independent study on their own. I'm going to provide some examples of each of the components of the thesis proposals, especially in the field of law, uh, so that you can get the, the nitty gritties now that we're talking about. When you're talking about, for example, the title page, I'll give an example. Reforming, for example, criminal sentencing guidelines in Uganda, yeah? A comprehensive study. I would expect to give your name, Isaac Christopher Lubogo, the institution, for example, call whatever university you want, and the date in terms of, you know, when you are carrying out that research. And if you're talking about an abstract, for example, I would give an example and say the proposal would outline a research project aimed at assessing, for example, the efficacy of criminal sentencing guidelines in Uganda, yeah? And the study, for example, six to identify discrepancies in terms of setting, you know, sentencing practices and recommend reforms in terms of fairer or even more consistent, you know, systems as it were. That, that's as simple as that, yeah? And then I'll give an example in terms of an introduction, yeah? In terms of the introduction, I would expect to talk about, for example, begin by discussing the rise, you know, in the in Uganda prison population, for example, in terms of concerns surrounding the sentencing disparities in the criminal justice system, and I will highlight the need of the research in this particular area. It's extremely important. I'm just giving a breakdown of some of the examples as well. Now, if I'm arguing in terms of literature review, I would give an example. I would summarize existing literature, for example, on criminal sentencing in Uganda, okay? Indicating key works, for example, on sentencing guidelines or mandatory minimums or even racial disparities in terms of sentencing. That becomes extremely important in terms of an example, yes? And then if I'm talking about research questions or even hypothesis, I would give an example, for example, in terms of research question, to what extent do maybe, you know, mandatory minimum sentence contribute to sentencing, you know, disparities in Uganda as far as the criminal justice system is concerned. In terms of a hypothesis, I'll probably argue and say mandatory minimum sentences uh, in terms of disproportionality impact minority populations resulting into sentencing disparities as a hypothesis. So you will test that hypothesis. We'll get there. Don't worry. I'm just giving you examples of sorts. Now, in terms of methodology, for example, I would give and say maybe this study will, you know, use a mixed method approach in terms of combining what they call quantitative analysis for sentencing data with qualitative interviews of judges, for example, and other legal experts. Yeah. So I will also discuss the rationale for selecting this method, including the need to balance statistical evidence with expert opinions. Yes. That is extremely important. Now, in terms of data collection and analysis plan, I'll give an example. The data files will be collected from maybe court records or sentencing databases over the years, for example, from maybe 2015, maybe to 2020, what, 23. In terms of statistical analysis, I will involve regression models, for example, to examine uh, all these sentencing disparities. And then I'll describe the process in terms of data collection, in, term of, in terms of data cleaning, in terms of the software that I'll use as I analyze my data, yeah? Now, in terms of expected outcome, I'll, I'll give an example. Maybe the argument is we anticipate finding statistical, you know, significant evidence in terms of racial or even ethnic disparities in terms of, you know, sentencing outlines or outcomes in terms of, you know, these findings will probably inform 
you know, recommendations for sentencing reform in Uganda, for example. Yeah. And then in terms of time frame or timeline for that purpose, I would create a detailed timeline indicating when I plan to complete each phase of the research. For instance, literature review, maybe by, you know, what, uh, say November 2024, you know, or perhaps January, depending on data analysis by maybe March 2024 or June, blah, 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 depending on what you do. Now, when it comes to referencing, I will be expected to provide a list of all sources I have cited in my proposal. For example, I expect to talk about the author, the title, the publication year, and the source. I'll give an example. Isaac, you know, I see sentencing disparities in Uganda, a review of the recent studies, 2021-3, a journal on blah, blah, blah. Yeah? So that it will give you that undertaking. In terms of appendices, if necessary, I would include any supplementary materials such as consent forms or a sample survey questionnaire, if applicable. Yeah, that is extremely important. Now, in terms of bibliography, if separate from the referencing section, then I would list what they call additional sources that I have consulted during my research that have not directly that have not directly cited in the proposal, such as books or even articles related to sentencing reform, for example, in Uganda. Yes. And then, so, uh, as you argue that and as you comprehend that, I'll be providing uh, a clear illustration of how each section, for example, of the thesis proposal in my law, uh, you know, dispensation should actually be structured and what content should actually contain. So, in other words, your own proposal, the proposal will be your, yours, it will be tailored to your specific research topic and in terms of your objectives. Now, let's talk about some of the research methods. Research. Uh, legal research can actually encompass various research methods, uh, each tailored on the specific research question or objective. I will explain different methods uh, in terms of methodology, in terms of res legal research, with examples for each. Yeah, let's begin with what they call doctrinal research. Now, under doctrinal, what they call doctrinal, doctrinal for that purpose, this method involves the analysis of existing legal materials such as statutes, case law, regulations, and even uh, legal literature. Okay, an example, for example, is analyzing how court decisions have actually interpreted, you know, specific statutes in terms of clarity of meaning and applications of what is provision. Yeah. Now, how about empirical research? When you're talking about empirical research as another form of research, here empirical research involves the collection of data through surveys, through interviews, through observations or experiments to study the legal phenomenon. Yeah, I'll give an example. For example, conducting interviews with judges to understand the decision-making processes in criminal cases and how sentencing guidelines are actually applied. Yeah, so that's another one. Yeah, and then we could also argue in terms of what they call comparative legal research. Now, this method basically involves comparing legal systems or laws or even practices across different, you know, different countries or jurisdictions to identify similarities and even differences. I'll give an example. Comparing, you know, the approach to perhaps intellectual property protection in Uganda and perhaps Africa in terms of assessing the harmonization efforts. Yeah, that's just an example. Yeah, and then in terms of uh, historical research, on the other hand, another as a form of research also, uh, you could argue that historical research will devolve into the past to examine the development of the legal principles uh, or the doctrines and the legal institutions as well. Yeah, I'll give an example. For example, maybe tracing the historical evolution of the right to, act, to privacy in Uganda, a case of law, you know, a case law and legislation. Yeah, in terms of examples. And then we we'll also argue in terms of what they call legal content analysis. Now, this basically this method involves systematically examining the content of legal documents such as statutes, contracts, and even court opinions. Yeah. An example is, for example, analyzing you know the language and structure of maybe what international trade agreements to understand the obligations and the rights of what signatory countries, a case study of Uganda. Yeah, that could be an, an example of sorts. Now, in terms of case studies, then case studies would involve what they call an in-depth analysis of a specific legal case or set of cases to understand the legal issues that are involved. I'll give examples. Maybe perhaps conducting a case study on the landmark human you know right case to explore its impact in terms of subsequent jurisprudence and even legal development. Yeah, so that's another example in terms of that. And then if you're arguing in terms of what you call surveys and questionnaires, then someone should understand that surveys and questionnaires are actually used to gather opinions, attitudes and data from legal professionals and also from scholars and the general public. I'll give an example. For example, you know, distributing surveys in the, or, or to legal practitioners to collect their views 
on the effectiveness of the alternative dispute resolution, for example, methods in maybe family law cases, as an example. Yeah. Now, if I'm to argue or explain something to do with legal field observation, now legal field observation basically will involve what they call first-hand observation of legal processes and activities within the legal institution. I'll give an example. For example, observing court proceedings to assess the efficiency or the efficacy or fairness uh, of the trial processes in a specific jurisdiction, yeah, as an example. Okay. Uh, if we talk about experimental research, on the other hand, experimental research basically will involve, uh, you know, designing controlled experiments to test what they call a legal hypothesis or the impact of legal intervention. I will give an example. For example, conducting a randomized controlled uh, trial to measure the effect of maybe specific legal education programs on the participants' knowledge of their legal rights. Yeah, that's just an example as well. And then you could also look at what they call contentious legal research. And under contentious legal research, it often involves what they call advocating for a particular legal position, such as preparing legal briefs or even arguments or litigation documents. Yeah, I'll give an example. For example, maybe preparing an amicus curiae brief in a high profile Supreme Court case. Yeah, to present legal arguments uh, and support specific interpretation of the law. Yeah, that would be a good example as well. Now, also another one we could look at is what they call theoretical legal research. Now, this method basically focuses on what they call the involvement of legal theories, models, and even concepts. Yeah, I'll give an example. For example, maybe constructing a new legal theory or framework to address what they call emerging legal issues related to the regulation of emerging technologies, maybe like what? Like artificial intelligence. Okay, just to mention uh, something that is probably trendy now. And then we could also look at it in terms of the core mixed methods. Now, when you're arguing in terms of mixed methods, you please understand that mixed method research combines different research approaches, for example, qualitative and quantitative, to provide more comprehensive understanding of the legal issue. Okay? So I'll give an example in terms of that. Um, by way of example, you'd say maybe using both interviews, qualitative and surveys, quantitative, to study maybe public perceptions, uh, you know, of the police in terms of the use of force and perhaps related legal regulations. Yeah? Again, I'll emphasize that the choice of methodology in legal research depends on the research question, it depends on the objectives and the nature of the issue uh, being investigated. So researchers often combine multiple methods to obtain what they call a well-rounded view of complex legal topics. Okay. Yes, and uh, the reason why I'm emphasizing that because at Sue Genes we pride ourselves in doing extensive research and many of you who may have challenges in terms of legal research, whether at undergraduate, post or even PhD level, we will be welcome to, uh, you know, come and, you know, we brainstorm and have some ideas. Now let's talk about different uh, referencing methods. Now, legal research requires precise and consistent uh, referencing methods to properly cite legal resources. So I'm going to give some common referencing methods that are used in legal research uh, with an explanation in terms as, as well as an example. There's what they call uh, blue book citation. Now, the blue book is widely used citation for the legal documents. Uh, it's very popular in the US and it provides for what they call guidelines for citation cases and even statutes and regulations and law reviews and even other legal resources. I'll do my best to, to, uh, to give practical examples using words rather than figures or whatever, the letters, literally. So in terms of example, you expect to take, tell us about the case citation, maybe Roe versus Wade, uh, 410, US, blah, 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 statute citation, maybe where it comes from in terms of the year, and then the law review citation, maybe Isaac Christopher Lubogo, uh, the fourth, you know, amendment digital age, in terms of maybe a Harvard review, depending on where it was published in terms of that. Okay, then we could also talk about what they call Harvard referencing. Harvard referencing, is very common uh, in legal research, by the way, especially for law review articles. It basically emphasizes in-text citations and a detailed bibliography. Remember that, in-text citation and detailed what? Bibliography. And when you're arguing in terms of in-text citation, you may want to say maybe Lugo 2020, in terms of you know, bibliography entry, Lugo IC 2020, maybe what? The fourth amendment in the digital age, and maybe maybe what? Harvard review this number or this page or this volume. Number three, you could also argue in terms of what they call the APA style, what they call the American Psychological Association style, which is used for legal research when interdisciplinary sources are actually referenced. Yeah, I'll give an example. Um, it also argues in terms of what they call the index citation. 
okay Lubogo 2020 perhaps referencing entry Lubogo IC 2020 maybe the fourth you know amendment in the different age and maybe from from the Harvard Law Review at page this one volume that yeah as an example and then you also maybe want to talk about what they call the MLA style yeah uh, what people call the modern language association okay style it's often used for legal research as well when dealing with the humanities and uh, interdisciplinary subjects i'll give an example again you will look at it in terms of an insect citation for example isaac you know one two three and then work cited entry isaac c or isaac ic uh, or Lubogo ic uh, the fourth amendment of the digital age harvard review volume 100 2020 at page maybe one two three yeah so that it helps you to comprehend what you're talking about. And then there's also what they call OSCOLA, which is very popular, Oxford Standard for Citation of Legal Authorities, OSCOLA. Now, the OSCOLA system is widely used, by the way, in the United Kingdom and many other countries for legal research, including Uganda. It's known for its precise you know, citation and style. I'll give an example in terms of uh, what OSCOLA. In terms of OSCOLA, tell us about the case citation, maybe Danage versus Stevenson, uh, square bracket 1932 appeal cases at page 562 in terms of study citation maybe what call it what um what the i'll give an example maybe uh, clean air act of this year or perhaps uh you know environmental act of this year that and then the page number okay if you talk about chicago chicago is another chicago manual of style chicago allows for both footnote citation and an accompanying bibliography and is used in legal research for its flexibility okay so an example is the word footnote okay row perhaps versus where which is a popular case many of you probably know it maybe page what uh, four and ten or this particular report in this particular year and then you probably tell us the act in, if it's relevant in terms of that as well and then there's also what they call the footnote style as a referencing. Now the footnote style is commonly used in legal documents such as court opinions, legal briefs, and even academic legal writing. So each citation basically appears as a numbered footnote, often corresponding to responses in terms of reference list at the end of the document. It's a bit common. Everyone who has gone to a substantive law school should understand what footnote is, yeah? Or not labor explaining much of that. Then there's also what they call um, the Vancouver system, yeah? Now, the Vancouver system is used for legal research, uh, you know, especially in uh, medical and even scientific law areas, and it relies on numbered citation in the text. Yeah, I'll maybe give an example to explain a little bit that. I'm using Roe versus Wade because it's, it's an interesting case. Those of you who haven't read it, there's Roe 1, Roe 2, Roe 3, and, and, and it's, it had a lot of jurisprudence in terms of uh, a, a change of uh, a right woman to own her body as it were. So if you look about maybe number one, Roe versus Wade, the year 14, and then the, 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 the reference of the court, and then the particular that actually uh, handled that, the year in which that particular case was handled, yeah? There's also what they call the EU style, what they call the European Union style. This is often used, for example, when referencing EU regulations and directives and even legal materials, yeah? I'll give an example. Uh, maybe talk about the Treaty on European Union, okay? Maybe 1992, uh, and then the, you know, reference in terms of uh, the particular journal, maybe OJC, and then the page number or the volume of that particular journal. And then there's what we call also custom style. Uh, some academic institutions or even law reviews may actually have their own unique citation style. So it's important to follow the specific guidelines when conducting research. It's extremely, extremely, extremely important. So you don't just assume that I'm going to use APA, I'm going to use Chicago, I'm going to use what? Oscola, I'm going to use Harvard. It's important. So in legal research, the choice of referencing method depends again on the publication requirements, the legal jurisdiction you're working in, and the nature of the legal document. So it's important for you to follow the prescribed citation accurately to maintain consistency and ensure proper attribution of what of resources. Yeah. Uh, another one that comes to mind what they call the Canadian Guide to Uniform Legal Citation, what people call MGL Guide. Yeah. The MGL Guide is uh, the standard legal citation guide used in Canada and it provides for detailed rules for citing legal sources in Canadian, in Canadian legal documents. Yeah, I'll give an example, especially when it comes to case citations. For example, R versus what? R versus uh, Lubogo, for example. Uh, square brackets 1990, volume through, and then you maybe SCRC, depending on the, the report, and then the page 679 or whatever. And then the statute citation may, may be Canada, Labor Court, or RAS and the year, and then you know the, the other sections as, as provided for. There's also what they call the Turabian style. Now, the Turabian style uh, is uh, a derivative of the Chicago manual style and it's often used in legal research 
especially for footnotes and endnotes yeah and uh, if you're talking about footnotes as i said many of you know footnotes those who don't know uh, you probably want to comprehend a little bit of what it means but they come at the end and they reflect the year and the case and the citation in terms of the details of the publication perhaps the year and the volume as well and so please understand that then there's what they call international legal citation what they call ilc now the ilc is employed for international legal research and it combines elements of harvard and oxford style and it's basically used for international treaties and even conventions yeah i'll probably give an example uh, when you're arguing that you might look at maybe the vienna convention of the law of treaties for example uh maybe page this and then the you know the the, the specific uh the treaty they're talking about maybe unts and the page and the yeah so that that is a bit uh, obvious in terms of that context then also there's what you call local legal styles uh, again depending on the jurisdiction or institution there may be local uh, legal citation styles or variations on standard styles uh, so researchers should actually be very aware of and, and they are to, to adhere to these when they are applying them yeah uh, I'll not labor to give uh, an example of local because as I said that is a mandate of uh, whatever whatever what whatever local area is uh, is choosing to opt or to use that particular referencing or style as it were and we may also have what they call online legal research database style so many online uh, legal research databases and platforms usually provide their citation styles for legal documents and it's so important that they use these styles when citing resources uh, from these databases yeah uh, and, and as i say that's again a preview of uh, those different uh, uh, online data spaces uh, that, that that would advise on how best to, to to cite whatever they want to cite so as i say legal researchers should be aware of the specific uh, citation requirements and the preferences of the intended audiences yeah so whether it's academic journal or a law review or perhaps a court or an institution okay and when you're doing that please understand that accurate and consistent citation is extremely crucial to maintain the integrity of the legal research yeah and ensure that readers can actually locate and verify the sources referenced in your work and, and that's that's the essence of that we're, we're going to go deeper and understand almost everything that you may need to know in terms of research legal research Let's probably try to understand the difference between referencing and bibliography. Some people may not know the difference between referencing and bibliography. Now, references and bibliography are related, but they serve slightly, slightly different purposes in academic and research writing, yeah? I'll begin with references, yeah? So that you probably comprehend and understand what do we mean by references and how do we know that this is a reference as opposed to a bibliography. Now, references are basically a list of sources that you have actually, you know, directly cited or even paraphrased within your document, yeah? And these sources are explicitly mentioned in your text through in-text citation or even footnotes, yeah? So please understand that. So references basically provide specific information about the sources you've used to support your arguments or your ideas or even your claims. Please understand that. And therefore, they serve as a way for readers to easily locate verify the sources that you've mentioned in your text yeah so references are typically placed in a dedicated section at the end of the security article for example a research paper or other academic work now usually the format of references depends again on the citation style that you're using such as maybe apa or mla or chicago or even blue book depending on what you're doing and i'll give an example in terms of maybe apa style referencing it would mention my name, for example, Isaac, or perhaps they begin with Lubogo, I C, 2020, maybe what? The law of what? Of witchcraft and in Uganda, okay? And then related to Sue Janae's what? Law publications, okay? This volume, or perhaps this, yeah, in terms of that. And bibliography. And now when you argue in terms of bibliography, a bibliography is a more comprehensive list of sources that you have actually consulted you know all consulted for your research even if they are not directly cited in your text yeah so a bibliography basically includes a broader range of materials such as the background reading for example the sources that informed your understanding in terms of the topic or additional resources that have really interested you during your research so unlike references yeah items in the bibliography are not necessarily linked to specific citation in the text yeah so a bibliography is often used to provide you readers with additional reading recommendations to give credit to all sources that contributed to your research, even if they didn't find their way into your in-text citation. Please understand that. I'll give an example of a bibliography entry. Yeah? 
Lubogov, I see the law of what? Of uh, the, the, the law of uh, witchcraft again in Uganda. <laughs> I'll give an example of that. Uh, and then I'll cite in terms of uh, Sue Jenae's publications, the volume and the year and then the page, depending on what we're talking about. So in summary, uh, references are basically specific lists of sources cited or even paraphrased within your document. So while the bibliography is a broader list of sources consulted for your research, both serve for the purpose of giving credit to their original authors and helping readers to assess the materials that you have actually used. So the specific terminology and formatting actually may vary depending on the citation style that you're using and the conversions of your field of study. Yeah? Let me discuss some disturbing things in research. The differences between hypothesis and research questions. It's a, quick, a tricky one, yeah? Hypothesis and research questions are both fundamental elements of research, but they serve distinct purposes and have different characteristics. So I'm going to give you some differences between hypothesis and research questions so that you can understand. Yeah? Let's begin with hypothesis. Now, when you're talking about when you're trying to comprehend or understand hypothesis, by virtue of nature, a hypothesis is a statement or a tentative proposition that suggests an expected relationship between variables and an anticipated outcome of the research. Yeah? Please understand that. And in terms of form, when you're arguing in terms of a hypothesis, it is typically formulated as a clear and testable statement or prediction. Remember that. So hypothesis can be directional, indicating the expected direction of the relationship. For example, there is a positive correlation between A and B, or non-directional. For example, there is a significant difference between group X and group Y. Please understand that. Number three, if you are talking about hypothesis, in terms of testing, hypotheses are designed to be tested and either accepted or rejected through empirical research, often using what they call statistical analysis. Please understand that. Number four, when you are talking about hypothesis in terms of the role, hypotheses are commonly used in what they call quantitative research to provide a framework for testing and making predictions about the population that is being what? Studied. And that's something that we we'll look at very quickly because by knowing the kind of research you're engaging, I would know whether you're going to use hypothesis or even research questions. Yeah? I'll give an example in terms of hypothesis. Increased hours of study are positively associated with what? High exam scores. Yeah? That's just an example of a hypothesis. Now, let's argue what we mean by research questions. By vacuum of nature, yeah? Research questions are what they call open-ended inquiries that aim to explore a specific aspect of a research topic without making a specific prediction. Please understand that. And that's why it becomes very strongly used in qualitative research. In terms of form, they are framed as questions and are typically broader and even more exploratory than hypotheses. Yeah? Now, research questions obviously guide the research processes in helping to identify the relevant data and the sources. Please understand that. Now, in terms of testing, research questions are not designed for direct testing or validation, but they are meant to guide the research process and provide a direction for investigation. Yeah? And they are very important because eventually they actually form your, your what? Your, 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 uh, I'll explain how they arise out of the objective, the specific objectives, yeah? But in terms of role, research questions are actually used for both quantitative and qualitative research. They are especially common in qualitative research where the exploration and understanding are actually what? Emphasized. I'll give an example in terms of a research question. What factors influence students' academic performance in maybe high school? Okay, as, as, as an example of a research question. So in summary, what you need to comprehend is that hypotheses are specific testable predictions about relationships or even outcomes often used in quantitative research. While research questions are open-ended inquiries that guide research and exploration commonly used in both quantitative and qualitative research, depending on the type of research and the research goals. So researchers may actually use both of these elements in their studies. Okay, let's go on how to write a very interesting one, literature review. Now, while 
writing literature review. It involves summarizing, first of all, analyzing and synthesizing relevant academic resources on a particular topic. Yeah? It's crucial. It's very crucial. It's part of the research paper in terms of thesis or dissertation. It provides the context and the theoretical foundation of your study. So I'm going to give you examples of how to write literature review with examples. Yeah? Number one, please understand when you're doing literature review, define your research topic. So before you begin, clearly define your research topic or question. This will help you to narrow down the literature that you need to review. Okay? Number two, search for relevant sources. Extremely, extremely important. Now, when you're conducting what they call a comprehensive search of academic databases, or even libraries, or even scholarly journals, to find out these relevant sources, use keywords or phrases related to your topic. Yeah? It's important for you to note the kind of keywords that you used to use as you're engaging your kind of research, so that you know that you get the information that is relevant for the kind of research you want to carry out. Yeah? Number three, organize the literature. It's important to organize your literature by simply categorize the sources into themes or subtopics based on the relevancy of your research question. So this will help you to create what they call a structured review. Extremely, extremely important. And then also, <clears throat> number four, summarize and synthesize. Yeah? For each source, for example, provide a brief of the key points in terms of the findings, in terms of the methodologies used, then analyze and synthesize the information to identify common themes and patterns. Sometimes you know you probably get to know what to call thematized literature review by in terms of thematizing it in terms of the themes, okay, or patterns as I just argued. And then organize <coughs> the review. Now the structure of your literature review can actually vary, but it often follows what they call logical progression. So I'm going to give an example of, uh, of what, what I'm talking about in terms of uh, uh, the, 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 the kind of example that I would like you to comprehend. I would expect you to talk about the introduction, introduce the research topic and its importance, and you state the purpose of literature review and its relationship with your research, yeah, as an example. And then in terms of the body, these are basic, some of you, if you did good uh, what? Essay writings, you probably know what you're talking about. In terms of the body, divide the body, uh, you know, of the review into sections or subsections based on the things that you've actually identified. So for each section, provide a summary of the key sources, their findings, and their contributions to the topic. And then an aspect in terms of analyzing and comparing the sources, pointing out the, co you know, the commonalities, for example, or the differences and the gaps in the existing literature. That's extremely important, the gaps in the existing research. And then use transition sentences to connect the section and create a coherent flow. Yeah? And then obviously in terms of conclusion, I would expect you to summarize the main findings, the contributions of the reviewed literature. Not so. And then discuss any unresolved questions or areas that are need of further research. And then explaining how the reviewed literature informs and relates to your own research. Very, 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 very important. Very important when it comes to this review. Because People, I mean, it's, it's fundamental. You just can't uh, let it be. And then in terms of citation and attribution, it's also important, by the way, in literature review, to ensure that you properly cite each source that you're using in terms of an appropriate citation, for example, APA or MLA or Chicago, for example. An example of citation, for example, of APA would be maybe Lubogo IC 2020 and the impact, for example, of environmental regulations on industrial population. And then in terms of where it quote came from, maybe environmental science and policy, and then the volume and the year and then the pages. Yeah? Extremely important. So in terms of example of literature review section, please understand that you may need to talk about the environmental regulation and industrial population as a subject. For example, I'm giving an example of literature review section. Maybe we talk about environmental regulation and industrial population or pollution for that purpose. And then several studies that have actually examined the relationship between environmental regulation and maybe industrial pollution, uh, and then it mentioned Lubogo 2020 found that maybe a stricter environmental you know, regulation led to a significant uh, what, decrease in the industrial emissions. A similar study conducted by, by what? Zabezi of 2018 also reported a notable reduction in the air and perhaps water population or pollution when stringent regulations were actually enforced. However, not all research findings support this pattern. And then you argue maybe what? 
Balamaze 2019 argued that the impact of regulation varies based on the industry perhaps or geographical location. So this results uh, need further investigation uh, in, in terms of the complex relationship between the environmental regulation and industrial population. So you see, I've argued different people, talked about different authors, but I've noted what they did, what they did not do, and also what I intend to do. So a well-structured literature review provides the context of your research. It demonstrates your understanding of the existing literature and helps you identify the gaps that your research can address. It also ensures that your research builds on previous work in the field, my friend. Yeah? Please understand that. Now, let's talk about theoretical framework. Another, another, another area that's a bit dicey. Theoretical framework basically is a conceptual structure that provides the foundation of research by outlining the theoretical concepts or principles or relationships that are relevant to a specific study. Yeah? It helps researchers, for example, to frame their research questions, their hypotheses, and methodologies within an established theoretical context. So I'm going to give an example uh, of what we're talking about here in terms of theoretical framework by way of explanation. Now, if I'm going to argue theoretical framework, I would probably talk about what is a theoretical framework in terms of an example. I would define and clarify the key concepts and the variables that are relevant for my research. Not so. I would explain the relationship and the interaction between these concepts. Not so. And also I provide a guide in terms of the development of research questions in terms of the hypothesis, but also in terms of the data collection methods. Yeah? And then I'll offer a lens through which the data analysis and interpretation will actually occur. Simple as that. Not so. I'll now give you another example. Examples of theoretical frameworks. Example number one. If, for example, I'm talking about health behavior theory, yeah, because maybe my argument is in terms of health behavior. So I'll argue in terms of health behavior theory. In terms of theoretical framework, I would argue and say health belief model, for example, right? In terms of explanation, the health belief model pos posits that individual health related behaviors are actually influenced by their perceptions of the threat of a health condition. And, you know, the perceived or the preserved benefits or barriers of adapting specific health behavior or cues can actually lead to researchers to engage in terms of investigating these factors that affect the decisions of people to adapt or even avoid what they call preventive health measures, such as vaccination. Okay, example number two. I would argue perhaps in terms of what they call social learning theory. Yeah, in terms of social learning theory, I'll talk about maybe, as a theoretical framework, I'll talk about maybe Bandura's social cognitive theory. Yeah, and if I'm explaining it in terms of Bandura's theory, Bandura theory focuses on how individuals learn from observing others in terms of social learning and how self-efficacy believes influence behavior. So researchers could apply this framework to study how observational learning and self-efficacy impact behaviors like substance use or even online privacy practices. Yeah, I'll give an example. Example three, in terms of maybe what they call economic theory. Yeah, in terms of theoretical framework, I would argue in terms of what they call rational choice theory. Explanation, in terms of explaining, rational share theory assumes, for example, that individuals make decisions by weighing the cost and the benefit of available options. So researchers may actually use this framework to understand criminal behavior where offenders are actually seen making what they call rational decisions based on what? Potential gains and risks. Right. I'll give an example. Example four, in terms of maybe what they call educational psychology. Right? Uh-huh. Under this, I'll probably argue and say theoretical framework, I would use what they call Bloom's taxonomy. Some of you know what the Bloom's taxonomy is. It's very important. Now, Bloom's taxonomy clarifies educational objectives into six levels of cognitive complexity. Yeah? From basic knowledge, recall to higher order, thinking skills, educators and researchers use this framework to design assessment uh, in terms of curricula, in terms of teaching strategies, aligned with specific learning objectives. Yeah? I'll give an example. Example five in terms of maybe what we call political science. I would argue in terms of the theoretical framework, in terms of what we call institutionalism. In terms of my explanation, I would argue and say institutionalism examines, for example, how formal and informal institutions shape political behavior and outcomes. And therefore, researchers could actually apply this framework to understand the impact of political institutions on governance policy, political stability in a given country. Yeah? I'll give an example in terms of what they call building, what they call a theoretical framework. Yeah, now this is extremely important. If you're arguing in terms of building a theoretical framework, now to construct a theoretical framework, researchers review existing literature to identify relevant theories or concepts, then adapt or combine these to fit in 
the research context. So the framework should actually align with the research questions and provide a clear structure of the study. Extremely, extremely important. Yeah. So in essence, a well-developed theoretical framework enhances the rigor, the coherency of research by anchoring it in established knowledge and guiding the research process. It can be especially valuable when it comes to interdisciplinary research where multiple theories may actually be relevant. Not so. That, my friend, is extremely, extremely, extremely important. Now, I want to give some um, differences for those of you who are engaging in research at undergraduate or, or postgraduate or master's level or even at PhD level. All the three, all the four, if you want. The differences between in terms of those uh, graduate levels. Now, the difference uh, when you're engaging in research in terms of these levels, the differences between undergraduate, master's, or even doctoral thesis are primarily based on the level of academic study in terms of the scope, in terms of the depth, and in terms of the expectations. I'm going to explain uh, some of these in terms of the thesis and provide uh, specific examples where applicable. If you're arguing a thesis in terms of an undergraduate level, by way of undergraduate, an undergraduate thesis is the research project completed during a student's bachelor's degree program. So it's typically less extensive in terms of in-depth compared to higher level theses. Yeah? In terms of the scope, undergraduate theses are often more focused and specific, addressing a particular aspect of a broader field. I'll give an example. An example in terms of an undergraduate majoring in psychology, for example, might conduct a research project that investigates maybe the impact of social media usage on self-esteem in teenagers. And I would argue that this thesis perhaps would involve a literature review, data collection, analysis, discussion. It wouldn't be extensive as a master's level or even as a doctoral thesis. Please understand that. Now, for master's level, those of you who are master's level, please understand that. By way of understanding, a master's thesis basically is a research project that is required for the completion of a master's degree program. So it represents a higher level of research and scholarship compared to an undergraduate thesis. Yeah? In terms of the scope, a master's thesis are more comprehensive and delve deeper into specific area within a field. So they require more thorough review of the literature and are more extensive in terms of data collection and in terms of analysis. Please understand. I'll give an example. Maybe, for example, a student pursuing a Master of what? Science in Environmental Science might actually conduct research on the impact of climate change on specific ecosystem. The ethics, uh, this thesis will actually involve a comprehensive literature review in terms of the fieldwork, in terms of data analysis, in terms of the presentation, and in terms of the findings. The scope and the depth of research would actually be greater than that of an undergraduate thesis. Yes and yes. How about if you're talking about doctor, um, dissertation, doctoral dissertation? By definition, a doctoral dissertation is a lengthy and original research project that is in the culmination requires earning obviously a doctoral degree such as a phd it represents the highest level of research and scholarship please understand that in terms of scope doctoral dissertations are substantial in terms of original contribution to the field of study they often involve the development of new theories methodologies or significant contribution to existing knowledge they require what they call literature review, data collection, analysis, and even synthesis, which is extremely important. I'll give an example. A PhD candidate, for example, in history, may undertake a dissertation on specific aspects of what? Ancient civilization, such as the role of trade routes in the development of the Roman Empire. This research basically will involve maybe an exhaustive literature review, original archaeological or even historical research, and the development of new insights or interpretations that significantly contribute to the field. In summary, the key differences between undergraduate, master's, and doctor theses are the level of academic study, the scope, the depth, and the expectation for original 
contribution. So as one progresses through these levels of education, these concerns become more challenging, more extensive, more demanding in terms of research, in terms of scholarship. So undergraduate theses are often narrower and the research focused master thesis expand this and the doctoral dissertation represent the highest level of academic achievement with focus on making substantial contribution to the field. Question is, how many of our PhDs are contributing in terms of knowledge? Anyway, the specific emphasis placed on undergraduate, masters or doctoral levels varies as I say, based on, on the academic journey and the objectives of each. So I'm gonna break down some emphasis on each type of thesis in those levels, yeah? For undergraduate thesis, as I said, your research skills emphasize the development of fundamental research skills such as conducting literature review, data collection, and analysis. Also, engage in critical thinking. Focus on cultivating critical thinking skills to understand and evaluate existing research and formulate research questions, yeah? Depth of understanding. Encourage a deeper understanding in terms of specific area within a field but within a more limited scope. In terms of structured writing, prioritize structured and clear academic writing, including proper citation and formatting. Please understand that. Now, if you're engaging master's thesis, please, these are important for you to note. Number one, engage in an in-depth research. In other words, place emphasis on more extensive and in-depth research that explores particular aspects of a field. Number two, original contribution. Encourage the development of what they call original insights in terms of methodologies or interpretations within a defined area. Yeah? Number three, you expect to have advanced analysis. Expect advanced data collection, analysis techniques such as advanced statistical analysis in terms of field work or even experimental research. In terms of literature synthesis, emphasize the synthesis in terms of integration of existing knowledge to provide a comprehensive context within your research. And then obviously a critical review. You are required to encourage critical review of your relevant literature and understanding the data, you know, the debates and the discussions within that particular field. Yeah? Okay. Now, if you're arguing in terms of a doctoral dissertation, important to note original research. The primary emphasis is on conducting original and substantial research that contributes significantly to your field or to the field as it were. It is requires what they call advanced theoretical development, encourage the development of what they call advanced theories in terms of the models or even frameworks that address the complex research questions. It also involves what they call interdisciplinary insight. Doctoral research often benefits from what they call interdisciplinary insight. So the emphasis may be on integrating knowledge from multiple disciplines and also publication quality expect research of publication quality often leading to peer reviewed journal publication and then obviously the rigor and the methodology place strong emphasis on rigorous methodology in terms of data collection and often involve advanced statistical analysis or advanced qualitative research techniques and then the aspect of independent scholarship emphasize independent scholarship including the ability to design, conduct, and even communicate research that is at the cut edge of knowledge in the field. Extremely, extremely important. In summary, the emphasis of each type of thesis aligns with, as I said, the level of academic study, the expectation from scholarly contributions. Undergraduate thesis introduce students to research skills and critical thinking, and that's why I will make that later. But master's thesis also focus on more extensive research and original contribution and doctor's dissertation emphasize what they call groundbreaking research and the development of advanced theoretical and even methodological expertise. Yeah? Now, we may be confused in terms of the difference between uh, a dissertation and a thesis. I'd like to throw some light in terms of that. Thesis and dissertation are often used uh, interchangeably, but there are differences uh, between them, obviously particularly in the context of academic study and research. So I'm gonna give you some uh, distinction between the thesis and the dissertation, yeah? Now, if we are arguing it in terms of an education level, please understand this, when you're looking at it in terms of education level, thesis typically is associated with a master's degree program, yeah? And often 
you know, required for perhaps the masters of art, of art or masters of law, masters of science, or any other master for that purpose. On the other hand, dissertation uh, generally associated with uh, uh, doctoral degrees, yeah, program. But, but as I said, it's a question of uh, what? Jurisdiction. And, and, and under that, it's required for the completion of perhaps a doctor of philosophy or a doctor of education or a doctor of business administration or any other doctor degrees for that purpose. Uh, and that, again, depends on, uh, on, 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 on what? On how the adaptation of some of the things from different uh, scholarly institutions, if you like. In terms of scope and length, um, in terms of the thesis, uh, you may want to look at it in terms of uh, it being perhaps generally shorter and less extensive in terms of scope and content. Yeah, um, basically, typically uh, ranging past between 50 to 100 pages, depending on the program and institution that it were. Yeah, um, in terms of dissertation, uh, then that would take considerably longer and perhaps even more extensive in terms of scope and content. That is something you must understand. So, and, and this can vary, but often exceeds 100 pages, with some doctoral dissertations spanning over 100 of pages. Uh, in terms of that context. I will not argue <laughs> in terms of, of mine, but I, 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 would, I would like to argue that some as big as, as this, hopefully, <laughs> including mine. Yeah, so in terms of research purpose, uh, the, the thesis, uh, in terms of argument, uh, a thesis basically primarily aims to demonstrate the, the candidate's master of the subject in terms of the research skills and in terms of what they call critical thinking at master's level. Yeah? And it often involves original, original research, but on a smaller scale compared to a dissertation. Yeah, uh, and then if you're arguing in terms of dissertation, then you want to look at it in terms of uh, uh, you know design to make an original contribution to the field of study. And I think that's to me that should be the most important, really, the most important. At PhD level, we shouldn't force people to do things that that are not coming from me. We should look at what gaps. Uh, uh, my friend. There's a PhD friend of mine who says uh, the, the PhD comics, what, what gap does it intend to fill? So it requires extensive in-depth in research project and advances knowledge in terms of the chosen area. Uh, and then uh, in terms of uh, research and rigor, when you're arguing in terms of the thesis, you may want to say it emphasizes research and analysis, but not, uh, may not require the same level of originality as rigor uh, as goes compared to a dissertation. Um, in terms of dissertation also, you may want to argue and say that it expects obviously a high level of originality in terms of methodological rigor and also in-depth exploration of, uh, of, uh, of chosen what topics as it were. And then in terms of examination and defense, uh, we may also want to argue that, um, that a thesis may require uh, a defense, but typically less formal and extensive than uh, a dissertation defense. Uh, in a sense that a thesis, you may will be required to do a viable course uh, perhaps a dissertation, you may want to meet what they call the doctoral committee and the public defense for that purpose. Uh, so dissertation often involves, as I said, rigorous and formal defenses of the research findings and the methodologies before a panel of experts. Yeah, and, uh, and, and, and can be quite gruesome in the sense that you are now making your, your case before experts, not so. In terms of audience, if you're arguing in terms of a thesis, uh, a thesis uh, typically you know, includes what they call academic advisors or committee members and peers within uh, the master's program. Yeah? And if you're looking at in terms of a dissertation, then uh, the, 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 the audience extends beyond the academic committee to include uh, other researchers and perhaps experts and even the broader academic community. And perhaps that's where we have the public defense uh, in, in terms of uh, a PhD level at that point. So it's important, my friends, uh, to note that the terminology and specific requirement can actually vary between institutions and countries. And some countries, for example, the term thesis and dissertation actually may be used differently. For example, in the UK, uh, the term thesis is often used for both masters and uh, doctoral research projects. While in the US, for example, a dissertation is typically associated with uh, doctoral level research. Uh, therefore, it's essential to consult, as I said, specific guidelines and the requirements of your institution when you are conducting uh, your research in, in terms of that perspective yeah um, what are some of the writing tools that we need to use in research um, there, perhaps that's something that is important for us to comprehend so let's take a closer look at how some of these writing tools are actually used in research processes and I'm going to argue 
for the sake of comprehending and understanding yeah um, number one is what we call reference management software uh, here we're talking about tools like N EndNote, tools like uh, uh, Zotero and Mendeley. These help you to organize and cite your sources by allowing you to import, to store, and even manage your references. And they typically work by letting you import references from maybe databases or the web. So the, you, know, you organize them into libraries and they insert citations and even generate bibliographies in various uh, citation styles when you are actually writing your research paper yeah number two we uh, we may need to comprehend what we call word processors now softwares like uh, microsoft word or even google docs and uh, maybe what they call library office what they call library office writer are the standard platforms for drafting and even formatting research papers so you simply type your content format it and add headings lists and images as needed and they also include features for you know managing references and even creating what they call bibliographies yeah another important one is what they call note taking apps yeah under note taking apps apps like evernote for example and even OneNote, they allow you to create digital notebooks so where you can actually take your notes uh, on your research they often support various multimedia elements like text or even images and web clips and even audio recordings and you can organize your notes into notebooks or into sections and tag for easy retrieval yeah and then uh, other tools for example like mind mapping tools uh, tools like uh, mind mister or what they call x mind uh, these will help you to create visual representation of your research ideas by allowing you to create nodes or even branches like linked together for you know that represent concepts and their relationships so they can help you to brainstorm and even organize your thoughts yeah so also that's another good one to consider and then the what they call bibliography generators tools like uh bibme or versa uh, cute cute like uh typically these work by allowing you to in you to input the details of of a source such as the author the title and even the publication information so they then generate citations and bibliographies in your chosen uh, uh, citation style yeah so that's another important one and then what we call grammar and spell checkers yeah tools like grammarly for example or even pro writing aid uh, a browser extensions or standalone applications that actually analyze your text as you write and provide suggestions to improve your grammar your spelling and even your writing style yeah so that's another important one and then the what we call collaboration tools uh, platforms like uh, google workspace and even microsoft office uh, 365 uh, they allow multiple users to work on the same document uh, simultaneously. So they also for, offer you know, features for commenting and track changes, making them ideal for what they call collaborative research writing. Yeah? And then we may also have others like um, data analysis tools, uh, software like R and Python, uh, with you know, libraries like Pandas. These are used for what they call statistical analy uh, analysis and data manipulation in research. They involve writing and running code to perform various data-related tasks. That's, that's extremely important. And then we have others that we call project management software. Yeah, tools like Trello, for example, or Asana, or even Notion. These will help you to manage research tasks and uh, deadlines by creating what they call uh, boards and even cards or tasks and setting uh, due dates and even priorities. Yeah, that's another important one. And then we also have what we call screen capture tools, uh, softwares like uh, Snagit uh, or inbuilt tools like Snipping Tool or even on Windows that are used to capture screenshots or even record video demonstrations, which can be useful to, you know, including use, uh, visual content in your research. Yeah. So it's important, my friend, that these tools are designed to make uh, different aspects of research and writing process more efficient and more effective. So from collecting and even organizing information, uh, to writing and editing the final paper so the choice of tools basically uh, you will depend on the specific needs of your research project yeah uh, we may also have others like reference search engines yeah platforms like google scholar for example or pubmed or uh, Jester, for example or uh, what they call ie explore they are used in in in, in search for what they call scholarly articles or books or even conference papers uh, researchers can actually input keywords authors and specific topics to find the relevant uh, sources yeah and then uh, we may have what they call writing templates yeah so many universities and institutions actually provide templates for various types of uh, academic documents including uh, research proposals and even abstracts and even academic papers so these templates often include standardized formatting and structure 
making it easier for researchers to follow the required guideline yeah so that's extremely also important for you then there's what we call pdf management tools tools like adobe acrobat tool, yeah, tools like pdf expert and even zamza they are used to manage and manipulate what they call pdf documents they can actually be used to combine or even split pdfs and even annotate pdfs and even combat pdfs to different formats that is also very important and then another important one is what they call plagiarism checkers and, and here we probably talk about things like Tanitin or even uh, what they call copy space they are used to ensure the originality of uh, research papers by checking for similarities with existing publishing works yeah so research, researchers really submit their documents and these tools provide a report highlighting the potential instances of plagiarism yeah we'll go a little bit into that at a later time and then there's what we call screenwriting software these are specialized software like maybe final draft or what they call selex and they are used in research related for what they call script writing and and film so these tools provide formatting and organizational features specific to screenplays and are useful for researchers in the field of media studies and even in film production yeah and then we may also have others that we call statistical analysis software for you know research that involve complex data analysis uh, tools like spss or matlab or even starter can be used to perform statistical tests of even regression analysis and data visualization that is another important one and then we have what we call qualitative data analysis software tools like uh, vivo or perhaps atlas you know these are used for what they call qualitative research and they help researchers to organize and even analyze textual and multi you know media data such as interviews surveys and even open-ended responses and then they what we call data visualization tools yeah tools like uh, tabla or even plotty or even excel these are used to create what they call visual representations of data such as charts graphs and even interactive uh, dashboards so it's important for conveying research findings effectively uh, i'll give you quite some others for purposes of emphasis this is what they call version control systems now for corrective well, what they call for collaborative research involving programming or document co-authoring uh, version control systems like git or, or code or what they call github uh, or what they call uh, others call it for code documentation they can actually be used to track changes and match contributions and even ensure a history of edits yeah and then we have what we call virtual reality and stimulation tools so in certain research fields such as education or even psychology virtual reality and simulation tools are actually used to create and even analyze uh, what they call virtual environments and even scenarios yeah so it's important my friends that the choice of these tools again depends on the nature of your research so your specific uh, field or your preferred flow workflow is, uh, will, will, will actually dictate so researchers often use a combination of these tools to stimulate their work from initial stages of gathering information to the final stages of writing and even presenting their work their findings now let me take you into something that is super 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 important uh, which uh, is a thing of the day now artificial intelligence in research yeah AI in research now if you talk about AI in research what jumps on your head chat GPT and the like people don't know that we have much more than chat GPT as we speak right now now artificial intelligence research tools are actually becoming increasingly important so as AI continues to advance rapidly these tools aid researchers in developing testing and even implementing now AI models and algorithms uh, are helpful. I was listening to a guy from Harvard talking about algorithms, uh, advanced algorithms, and, uh, and, and I got to understand a few things in terms of algorithms. But let's talk about AI. This is what they call TensorFlow and Py, uh, what, what they call PyTorch. So these are open source machine learning libraries that actually help researchers to build and train AI models. They provide extensive support to, for deep learning, including neural network, design optimization and even deployment so researchers can actually use them for various ai applications from image recognition to natural language processing what we know mostly is what they call nlp which is natural language processing but it's much more than that yeah there's what they call jupyter notebooks as another ai jupyter is a popular tool for creating and, and, and sharing documents that contain live code in terms of equations visualization and even narrative text so researchers use Jupyter notebooks for AI research to document and share their work, making it easier for others to understand and even reproduce their work, the experiments. There's another one that they call uh, Skizit Learn. Skizit Learn, this library basically provides simple and efficient tools for data mining and even data analysis. So researchers basically use it for machine learning tasks like maybe classification, regression, 
uh, clustering and even what they call dimensionality in terms of reduction yeah uh, i'll give you another one this is what they call keras now keras is an open you know source deep learning framework that serves as an interface for what they call tensorflow and other you know uh, back-end frameworks it allows researchers to quickly prototype and even build neural networks making it easier to experiment with different model architectures as it were then the popular one your guy called open ai chat gpt3 ai researchers and developers access it chat gpt language model through you know apis so this tool is used for natural language understanding text generation and a wide range of application in what they call nlp research guess what it's developed now into chat gpt4 I wish you know what ChatGPT 4 We're going to have another discussion on ChatGPT 4 This is what we call KEF. KEF is a deep learning framework that is evolved by the Backlit Vision and Learning Center. It's commonly used for image classification and object detection and image segmentation in computer uh, vision research. Yeah? And there's what we call Pandas. Pandas is another powerful data manipulation that analyzes library for Python. Yeah? So researchers use it basically to process and even analyze data before feeding it into an AI model. Yeah? Some of you are thinking that I'm talking, maybe, <laughs> maybe I'm, I'm, I'm an AI here, not, not Lugogo here. No, I am myself, but I'm just trying to comprehend these things because I take the pride in, in studying them. So there's one called IBM Watson. IBM Watson offers a suite of IA tools and services, including machine learning, natural language processing, and even computer vision capabilities. So researchers can actually utilize these tools for a wide range of AI applications, including chatbots and recommendation systems and sentiment analysis. Yeah? Talk about chatbots. I have a guy, a friend of mine, mm. who does chatbots. We have all these guys at Sujanese. This is what we call Rasa. Rasa is an open source framework for building you know, conversational AI chatbots, which ChatGPT4 is now doing in terms of uh, developing and, and deploying a different uh, you know, AI in terms of a variety of industries. Yeah? And then there's what we call uh, MXNet. MXNet is a deep learning framework that offers both flexi flexibility and high performance for AI research. It supports basically deep learning and various domains, including computer vision and even uh, natural language processing, which is the most common AI that we may have uh, as of now. Uh, there's what we call also huging face transformers. Yeah, huging face transformers provide what they call pre-trained natural language processing models and libraries that researchers can actually use for tasks like what text classification and even translation, summarization and even question answering. Yeah, and, and that's another now. Your guy, Google, Google AI platform is another super good one that Google has actually adapted now. Google's platform also offers what they call cloud-based tools and services for AI researchers. It includes AI training and prediction services as well as uh, data storage and management tools and adaptive learning. Yeah, it adapts as it learns or, or as, as, you know, as you engage with it. So these AI tools assist researchers by providing them with infrastructure, libraries and pre-trained model needed to develop experiment with and even deploy what they call AI models and algorithms. So they streamline the research processes allowing researchers to focus on solving complex problems and also advancing the field of artificial intelligence. So yeah, that is extremely important. I'm going to give you uh, a few others just for, for purposes of understanding. This is what we call fast AI. Yeah. Now fast AI is also known for making deep learning more accessible. They provide what they call high level interfaces uh, and pre-built models for tasks like image classification and even natural language processing, making it easier for researchers to experiment and even uh, iterate quickly. Yeah, and there's another one called Thino. Uh, Thino. Thino, although not widely used uh, tens uh, as TensorFlow or even Python, uh, Thino is a numerical computation library that can actually be helpful uh, in terms of AI researchers, particularly in academic settings. It's known for its efficient computation and even symbolic mathematics capabilities. Yeah, please understand that those of you who are mathematics and. Yeah, then there's what they call Allen NLP, okay? Allen NLP, Natural Language Processing, is an open source natural language processing library built on top of what they call PyTorch. So it's designed for research in NLP and provides for pre-built components and tasks like, you know, classification, entity recognition, and even uh, what they call core conferencing resolution, yeah? Uh, that's another one. Then there's also what they call Open AI Gym, yeah? Open AI Gym, is a toolkit for developing and even comparing reinforcement learning algorithms. Yeah, and it provides for a wide variety of environments for researchers to test and even benchmark their reinforcement learning agents. Yeah, I'm going to give you some few others. There's also what you call Orange. Orange is an open source data visualization machine in terms of uh, learning uh, toolkit. Toolkit. Uh, it's basically particularly useful in terms of researchers 
who want to explore processes, what they call pre-processes, in terms of visualizing data before building machine learning models, yeah? And there's another one also, what they call Stanford NLP, uh, Natural Language Processing, obviously. Now, Stanford NLP provides a suite of what they call natural language processing tools, including uh, part of speech tagging, name entity recognition, and uh, synthetic uh, parsing. So researchers can actually use these tools to process and even analyze uh, you know, text data, as it were. Another interesting one is what they call Wika. Now, Wika is a data mining and uh, machine learning software that provides for graphic user interface, uh, you know, for researchers to experiment with various uh, machine learning algorithms and data analysis techniques. And then another one that you may want to look at is what they call Microsoft Cognitive Toolkit, yeah, CNTK. CNTK is an open deep uh, learning framework developed by Microsoft, yeah? And it's used for deep learning research and application, particularly in the field of speech recognition and computer vision, yeah? All these are extremely important. I'll give you another one that they call AutoML. Now, AutoML tools, uh, these are automated machines learning AutoML tools, like, for example, AutoSKLearn and what they call H2O.AI, yeah? That, that can help researchers to automate the process of what they call model selection and what they call uh, hyperparameter you know, tuning and even uh, feature engineering, yeah? Uh, so these are quite broad and very helpful. There's also one they call AI Ethics Toolkit, yeah? Tools and frameworks like the so-called AI Toolkit, uh, you know, by the Alan Tuning Institute. These help researchers and practitioners to address what they call ethical considerations in AI research and development. Then we have what they call the GitHub and the Git. Now this basically helps virtual control systems like Git and platforms uh, and they are crucial for collaborating in terms of AI research, in terms of projects, in terms of tracking changes, and in terms of sharing codes and models, yeah? Then we have another one that's called Google Colab and uh, Kego Kennels, yeah? Now, these cloud-based platforms like Google Colab and Kego, and, uh, Kego Kennels provide free access to uh, the, the GPU and the TPU resources, making it easier for researchers to experiment with AI models without investing in powerful hardware, yeah? Um, you may also want to impress yourself when they call AI research conferences and journals, yeah? Uh, because when you access these research papers, for example, or data, set, or, or da, or data sets, uh, the, you know, and the latest advancement in AI, it can be found through conferences like uh, Neuro uh, IPS or CVPR, or even journals like, uh, you know, AXV and even uh, JMLL, yeah? So, as I say, these tools and resources are valuable for AI researchers at different stages of their lives from data processing in terms of uh, model development, collaboration, and they also have to bear what they call ethical consideration when you're engaging in AI. And researchers use these depending on their specific needs and the domains that they are actually working on. Now, let's talk about something that is super important in research, uh, which is we call plagiarism. Plagiarism, and I'm gonna argue in terms of what we call plagiarism checkers. Now, plagiarism checkers are tools designed that help you to identify instances of plagiarism uh, in written context by comparing it to databases of existing text, yeah? So I'm gonna give you some examples of plagiarism checkers and how they work. I'm not going to give you ways of how to beat plagiarism. <laughs> Although we have ways, a two genes of how to beat plagiarism, yeah? But let's talk about Tanitin. Tanitin is one of the most widely used plagiarism checker, especially in academic setting. It works by, you know, comparing the submitted text against vast databases of academic and even non-academic content including website. So research papers, essays, and more. So it highlights potential matches uh, and generates a similarity that report that includes the percentage of matching content. So educators often use Tanitin to ensure originality in terms of the student level. I have problems with Tanitin <laughs> compared to others. I will not discuss those shortcomings, <laughs> but we have them at Sujanese. Grammar is another. Grammar is probably known as a grammar and spelling checker. Its premium version basically includes a plagiarism checker. Obviously, it scans through your text and compares it to an extensive database of web pages and in terms of academic content and identify potential instances of plagiarism. It provides similarity scores and even highlights a portion of the text that can actually match uh, the other sources. Yeah. Uh, another one is what they call copy uh, copyscape. Copyscape is another. One. Copyscape is a popular online plagiarism checker. It's also used to scan the web content uh, for you know duplicate and copied material. And you, and you can enter, you know, the ULR or copy and paste text into the tool and it will search the web 
and, and match the content. It's commonly used by website owners and even content creators to ensure originality of their online you know, content. There's also what they call plug scan. Now, plug scan is another plagiarism checker that is designed for academic and even professional use. It checks submitted text, for example, against vast databases and even provides a detailed similarity report. So users can actually you know, exclude citations and references uh, from the reports to get a more accurate uh, picture of the potential plagiarism. Yeah? There's another one which they call uh, Qtex. Yeah? Now, Qtex is an online plagiarism checker that scans your you know, text for similarities across a wide range of sources including academic publications, websites, and even articles. And it provides a similarity percentage and even highlights the matching content, as I said. Um, Ukun. Ukun is another one. We used to use Ukun. Ukun. I prefer Ukun, but I'm not there as you. Ukun is another one, but also before we go to Ukun, we'll talk about Grammarly Plagiarism Checker, though the premium one. Yeah? In, this, in addition to standard you know, Plagiarism Checker, Grammarly offers a premium version that provides for a more comprehensive check. So it scans the text against the broader range of sources, including academic databases, to identify potential instances of plagiarism. As I said, Ukun, to me, was better than the other. I will not mention it for my reasons, but I will tell you later. There is what we call Unicheck. Unicheck is a plagiarism detection tool designed for educators and decisions. It basically integrates with what they call learning management systems. LMS like Modu and uh, Canvas to check on uh, student submission for plagiarism. It offers similarity reports with highlighted matching content. Yeah, as I said, many universities prefer Turnitin for their reasons. I not go there. But then we have what we call Dupli Checker. Now, Dupli Checker is an online plagiarism checker that allows you to copy and paste text and even upload documents for checking. Yeah, it uh, searches the content against multiple sources on the web and even provides yeah, you know similarity percentage along with highlighted reports. Yeah. So, as I said, plagiarism checkers work by using algorithms to compare the text. I just had a discussion with some gentleman from Harvard who was taking me into advanced algorithms, yeah, uh, where we submit, I'll get into that another day. But as I said, when the match is formed, the tool highlights the matching portions and generates a report that often, you know, includes symmetry score. So, it, you know, the users can then review the report and decide whether the identified symmetry is actually acceptable or even constitute plagiarism. So these tools are, you know, valuable for educators, for content creators, for writers, for researchers to ensure the originality and the integrity of their works. Yeah? Now, please understand that the acceptable level of plagiarism varies among educational institutions, yeah? And even within different departments, even programs. However, it is important to note that any level of plagiarism is generally unacceptable in academia. So plagiarism is considered a serious breach of academic integrity and institutions that have strict policies and consequences of plagiarizing, ranging, you know, failing even a course, even up to its version. You know, so you have to be extremely, extremely, extremely super careful. Don't engage in plagiarism. Never engage in plagiarism. Let me give you some guides for plagiarism checkers, yeah? Especially from all the different levels, from undergraduate, master's to PhD. If you're dealing undergraduate level, accept the level, in terms of uh, acceptable level of plagiarism, is very low. You need to understand that it must be extremely low, up to none. So the undergraduate level students are expected to demonstrate a fundamental understanding of academic integrity, even minimal plagiarism, such as copying a few sentences without proper citation, is typically considered unacceptable. So students should properly cite their sources in their essays, in their reports, in terms of assignment to avoid plagiarism. So any significant unattributed use of external content is generally not tolerated. Please understand that. When you're dealing with it in terms of master's level, in terms of acceptable level of plagiarism is extremely low to none. I'll give an example, yeah? Master's level students are expected to exhibit a high level of academic integrity. They are often required to produce original research Thesis, right? Original research thesis and substantial papers. So any plagiarism, even in small portions of a document, is typically taken seriously and can lead to severe consequences. So students should be proficient when it comes to proper citation and referencing to avoid unintentional plagiarism. Yeah? Now, at PhD level, acceptable level of plagiarism, virtually none. Zero. Kabisa. Right? Example, at PhD level, students are expected to make significant contribution in their field through original research and dissertation. So plagiarism is often considered as a cardinal sin in the academia at this level. So the focus is on creating what they call new knowledge. 
So even minimal plagiarism can result into rejection of, his, of, of your dissertation. Please understand that. So it's very, very crucial, my friends, to understand that institutions have often specific policies and guidelines when regarding plagiarism. So it is essential to be familiar with your institution's code of conduct and academic integrity in terms of your standard. So in all cases, emphasis should actually be on producing original work and properly citing and referencing external sources to avoid any form of what? Plagiarism. Now, when you're in doubt of some of these things, please consult your institution's academic integrity for guidelines. So if you have questions about citation and referencing, ask your professors, for example, ask your academic supervisor for guidance so that they can help you. Yeah? Now, please understand that anti-plagiarism software typically provides a similarity score or a similarity percentage to indicate the degree of matching content found in the document. So these similarity scores can vary slightly between different plagiarism checkers, but they generally operate, as I said, in the principles that we just talked about. That becomes extremely important. I cannot overemphasize that. As I said, undergraduate level acceptable plagiarism perhaps below 5%. But again, this may depend on what? On the institution that you're dealing with. A document with a similarity score of 1 to 5% suggests that a very minimal account of the content is actually similar to what? Other sources. As I said, institutions at undergraduate level often consider similarity scores above 50 as indicative of the fact that there was potential plagiarism and may actually investigate the matter. Not so. Yeah? And uh, because of the much use of the net, I see the, the, the challenge that we have, you know, almost in terms of getting information left, right, and center. Yeah? In terms of acceptable level for master's level, below 3% uh, in terms of similarity examples. So, a document perhaps with uh, a similarity score of about 2% or less is considered to be very low in terms of potential plagiarism. Uh, but, so, therefore, institutions at master's level may actually have stringent expectations in terms of uh, originality. In terms of PhD level, um, acceptable plagiarism, as I said, virtually none, typically below 1%. Yeah? Uh, you will argue and say, how possible is this, especially if you are lying in The point is, not, and, and that's why I have a problem with some of these checkers, yeah? That's why I was telling you, Ukon, vis-a-vis, -vis, turn it in, the argument of similarity vis-a-vis -vis actual plagiarism. For PhD, as I said, 1% and below. But, but my point is, is that similarity without, without referencing, yeah? Without giving acknowledge that this information, and that's where some, some plagiarism, you know, testers have problems, yeah? Because then, if I've written a book, and I've cited it, and then another person cites it, and goes to the net, and finds that so-and-so wrote the book, it may highlight that. So the question is referencing, or giving what? Authoritative acknowledgement that this information came from so-and-so, which is okay in academic, in the academic field, but that, that's a question of debate, and, and that's perhaps some, another concern that we may have to uh, underscore when we are really looking at the ethics of, uh, of academic integrity in terms of producing what they call original work, and whether or not original uh, still exists even as we speak today. Yeah, I will not get into the ideas of how to beat uh, plagiarism using an ethical means. I will argue, I've argued it in terms of using extremely ethical and academic means. Yeah, uh, it will involve, as I said, creating your original work, properly, uh, you know, crediting sources when you're using someone else's work or even ideas. And uh, how do you do that? Number one, please understand what constitutes plagiarism. Avoid plagiarism. You must first understand what it is. Uh, as I said, it includes copying someone else's work, ideas, and work without proper attribution. Yeah? The point is simply attribute. This is from Lugo, blah, 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 or this is from so-and-so. You don't have much problem there. Cite the sources properly. That's another issue. Whenever you use someone else's ideas, quote, or even recite, provide clear and accurate citations. Follow the right citation guidelines in terms of where APA or MLA or Chicago recommended by your institution or your, by your professor. Yeah? And then paraphrase and summarize. Yeah? It's extremely important. So when you're using someone else's ideas, paraphrase or summarize them in your own words. Ensure that your paraphrase content does not closely resemble the original one source if you want. Uh, I'm just giving you academic uh, ethical mm -hmm. hints in terms of that. And then quote directly when necessary. Not so. So you, if you must use the exact wording from a source, you know, enclose the, the, the text in a quotation mark and provide a citation. Quotes should be used sparingly and for emphasis. Yeah? 
And then obviously another important aspect is to manage your time. Procrastination is a thief of time. Procrastination can actually lead to rushed research and writing, making it more likely that you actually resort to plagiarism. So manage your time effectively to allow for what they call proper research, proper citation, and in terms of original writing. And then as I said, engage and use plagiarism detection tools. Consider using plagiarism detection tools like Tanitin or Grammarly, uh, plagiarism checkers to review your work before you submit. Yeah, so these tools will help you to identify unintentional plagiarism. Yeah. Uh, it will give you the, the benefit of knowing that, okay, my work is original or I have to change it in certain perspectives, yeah? And then organize your research. Keep, your, you know, through notes and records of your research, including sources and even publication details. Organize your research. It will make it easier for you to cite uh, these sources correctly. And then another important aspect is seek permission, yeah? If you want to use copyrighted materials in any way that goes in terms of fair use, such as extensive quoting or even using images, seek permission from the copyright holder, yeah? Some of you who know uh, intellectual property, you probably understand what I'm talking about. And then also, obviously, another important aspect is consult style guides, yeah? Familiarize yourself with citation and referencing guidelines of your chosen citation style. As I said, either APA or MLA or Harvard. So these guides will provide specific rules in terms of citing various types of sources, yeah? And then also, very, very important, ask for help. At research level, you are obliged to ask for help. It's not seen to ask for help, even engaging research assistant. At Sue Generis, we do that. So if you are unaware or unsure of proper citation or even need of assistance, avoiding such things like prejudice or stealing people's information, ask for help either from libraries or from professors or from writing centers. There are quite good centers in this country. Find some of them. We have one at Sue Generis where we do that. Also, use plagiarism detection software for self-check, yeah? If you have plagiarism detectors, lose like grammar, allow yourself to self-check your work for potential plagiarism before you submit it. And also importantly, revise and edit carefully. So after writing, review your work and ensure that you have cited all the sources properly and paraphrase them as they are required to be done. And also, be honest and ethical. Very, very important aspect. The most effective way to avoid plagiarism is to maintain a commitment to academic honesty and ethics. Yeah, always aim to produce original work and give credit to where it is due. It's very important. That's what we do at Sui Genes. Almost everything we're doing here is novel. People ask us questions. Why do you write on this? Why do you write on that? Someone even teases us to write things on things that none exist. And we laugh and say, we say, we shall be like, what? Bernard Shaw. Most men see things that they are and ask why we dream of things and ask why not. Yeah, we'll be like 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 one of my favorite guy, the American um, hero of sorts, black hero of sorts in terms of uh, adv advocating for the rights of, 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 of what black people. Not 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 Dr. King. Dr. King is my my guy, my mentor. But another one who said that the world has made uh, being black a vice. I intend to make it a virtue. Uh, those of you who read our book, uh, what the art of oratory, the articulate lawyer or the future advocate or find almost all those and then we have another beautiful one that came out that had to do with with super quotation some of you have seen us quoting extensively uh and these are hurricane moments that, that that god drops on our minds like mana and and, and we comprehend and then pass them over to the people uh, look for that book uh, uh called the gospel according to generis you will find in, in, interesting interesting submissions in, interesting quotes about life and and many many of our books when you go to sue generis uh, lawapp.com or you go to lubogo.org. So my friends, consider that uh, a dispensation of uh, research in terms of how to get an A in research or how to excel in your research. My name is Isaac Christopher Lubogo from right here at Sue Genes, and God bless you and thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, madam, as well.